Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back for the third part of the Amiga Terrible Fire A4000 boards. Uh, so, as we left things at the end of part two, we still didn't have the IDE working, and I think one of the boards was still completely dead. The other thing I can't help but wonder here is, is it to do with his options? The fact that this is not delivering the options properly. And we know that because, and I'll perhaps show you in a minute, if you boot uh, SysTest, it's reporting uh, Bad, you know, the Lisa ID is incorrect or something. You know, maybe it thinks it's got a gale when it hasn't, or something like that. So I checked every single connection on the ID connector there, everything's joined up. So there's still an absolute mystery as to what is going on with the IDE. So I found an interesting comment from David Haney posted on a few different websites suggesting that this, well not suggesting, cl clarifying what this is for. This is to pass some uh, configuration through to Lisa. Lisa reads the um, mouse, and, uh, mouse ports through here, through this first 166. So this just serializes the data. Each of the directions on the ports connected up to, you know, um, uh, there's eight inputs on there and it reads them serially through uh, to uh, Lisa I think I think Lisa does that uh, ignore this wire going over to uh, Alice over here it's for something else that I think so what they did they extended it and read another eight bits instead of just reading the eight bits for the mouse they also read another eight bits these jumpers here now you can see that there aren't enough jumpers for eight you know there's not eight there's one two three four five six six jumpers so there's two bits on that chip and david haney pointed out the first two bits are hardwired so that's why we've only got six jumpers so in theory you've got eight you know eight bits it's reading uh, again through to lisa after it's read the mouse presumably um and I think the way Stephen got this working is just hardwired it. It might be reading either all lows or all highs. It, it's got to be because there's only one chip here. It, you know, it can't read anything from this chip. It's not there. Uh, and I did wonder, whilst it says the first two bits are hard coded and should be high, I've measured that. Uh, I went on the Amiga PCB Explorer and looked. And the first two bits on the chip that's here that's missing are wired, I think it's A and B, are wired to uh, high. So, uh, so is it ground? So yeah, the first two bits should be ground, actually. Um, so if this is hardwired and the first two bits are ground, that means the other six bits are going to be read as ground. Well, these aren't, you know, that would be the equivalent of the jumper in these over. They've got a weak, uh, you know, 4K7 uh, pull-up here. So, the, the, you know, the high is default. You put the jumper on to uh, pull them to ground, presumably. I mean, I could have that the wrong way around. It might be you stick the jumper on and it pulls them to five volts, but I think not. Let's just uh, test, actually. Let's just test what's going on there. Yeah, so this side here on these is five volts, and then I'm guessing the other side, and we might not be able to measure here because the traces might have gone. Yeah, so that one's there. Is this side ground, maybe? Yeah, it is. So when you jump this, you're pulling the other side of it to ground, you're pulling it low. So as default, it should be reading low, low, and then six high bits. What do those six bits do? Um, or are they just optional things that were never utilized or something? I don't know. Anyway, we need to deal with it one way or another. So, so there is no way to uh, just glue that down. You can't, uh, you know, I tried. If you stick a bit of super glue there, because the underneath of the chip is lifted off by the legs, it doesn't marry with the board. Um, so you know what, I'm doing something here that I never thought I'd ever see myself doing, which is, uh, if you watch one of my early AES repairs, Neo Geo AES, uh, I was removing a spongy pad from underneath and I was like, oh my god, what Muppet has stuck uh, a sticky spongy pad underneath this. And uh, the irony for you, here we are, years later, and I'm doing the exact same thing myself. But, you've got to get creative with something like this. Well, you know, what you're going to do, it's a surface mounted IC, you've got to uh, find some way of mounting it on there. I'm trying to get this pad so you can't really see it. So I just need to shrink it down a bit more. I think before I commit to soldering anything around here, and what I'll perhaps try and do is have a pretty sturdy 5 volt connection, you know, the VCC connection. I'll use a pretty thick wire like from a capacitor or something to that pin there. And then the same with the ground. 
to this chip over here so that it'll act as a scaffold and kind of just hold it you know because it's a bit spongy you know you can bounce it up and down and wiggle it around and that's what you don't want so with those two pins fairly tightly restricted there and then the other smaller wires and things on it it should be all right it, there's no easy solution it's always going to look a mess because someone wrenched the chip off uh, well to be fair the pads probably just disintegrated so uh, anyway, let's uh, just remove that cap. That's the point I was going to make. Let's uh, get rid of this cap here. So I'll just try and move this wire out of the way. Yeah, it stinks. I can smell the electrolyte already with that. It's just a 4.7. It's the last capacitor on the board. But if we deal with that now, we should be okay. I've checked the connectivity around the real-time clock previously, and that seems okay, surprisingly. It seems to be the one thing around here that's survived. I mean, it does come up saying no clock detected. There we go. So amazingly we haven't lost the pads again, that's uh, nice. So I've got the uh, super fine tip on the iron here. Um, anyway, let's just get this cap on. What I've been trying to do is just, cr there you go, flood a crazy amount of solder like that. Because when one side's done the other one is really easy and if you've got unusual shaped solder points you can just uh, reflow with a little bit of flux, but that looks good actually on both sides now. So I've got the pin out of the uh, chip here, just because that's going to help me work out what needs to go where on the, the one we've just stuck down. So making sense of the connections here, it looks like the VCC and ground are just because the VCC and ground are missing off this IC actually. Um, and then we've also got a wire going up here, a crazy long one, you can just about see to Paula. It's just because of a broken tray, so I can fix that with without a wire that long, I'm sure. Um, and then the other one down here is just another fix because there's a broken tray. So anyway, if I exclude all that lot, I've got the pin out here of the IC that we're going to uh, put. You know, it's going to be that way around like that on the board, our chip here. Now it strikes me there's a few ways you could uh, make this a bit simpler. You could literally mount this IC on top of this one, bend down certain pins because, for example, these three pins here. Are they joined up the same on the other chip? That one's joined up on the other chip. Those two are joined up on the other chip. So you could literally bend those pins down, solder those pins down onto this chip here. It would be a bit of a fudge, but it'd be a piggyback. Uh, and then just route the uh, individual wires. Now bear in mind, what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to, uh, you know, these are going to get hard coded, hard fed, uh, you know, uh, force fed, low, and then like C, D, E, F, G, H are all going to be a high. So I can literally just bridge with some solder because the pins are quite close to each other. I'm going to join a wire there, join a wire over here. And yeah, so there's going to be, I don't know, several wires at the end of this. But at least hopefully it should work. The difficult thing is it's very small and fiddly to work on. So I've almost finished the uh, bodge up here, which I'll show you in a minute. It does look a bit of a mess, if I'm honest, but... I've made it as tidy as I possibly can. I can tidy it up further yet. Uh, you can see testing with the uh, four uh, four meg sims here. Uh, now I've got a correction. When I, earlier on I thought these sims were one meg, they're not. They are definitely four meg sims. It's a case of, and I need to research this myself. It's not something I was well. I was vaguely aware of it. That you used to be able to get, I think, like double rack sims where you've got the chips on the back. And there's something different about them, like they sit on a different bank or something, something weird about the way that works. So it's probably not weird, it's probably dead simple. But uh, most of them are just like this, chips on one side, and, you know, it's four meg module, it works fine. But if you put one of these four megs in here, it's detected as one meg instead of two meg. And it's almost like, because it's not got the chips on the other side, it could be four meg, but I have two on each side. Then, when it was in this slot here, it would be detected as two meg. So... Uh, yeah, I need to look at that. It's going to be. It's going to relate to the pinout. You might be able to modify. I doubt it, but you might be able to modify uh, one of these uh, single rack sims, if that's what they're called. I don't know, and uh, trick it. But I, I'm not sure. You probably have to do so many modifications to it. It probably isn't worth it. But as you can see, that's going round. We've got 18 meg. Uh, you know, two mega chip, 16 meg fast, and uh, it's gone round. Uh, you know, it's on its third pass now, or its second pass. Yeah, it's on its second pass because it starts on one point whatever, doesn't it? Um, so I'll let that go around a few more passes. Uh, I'm just testing this RAM at the same time because this is a uh, new RAM here. So fixing the uh, 166 round there, you can see now it's given us a proper uh, thing here with Denise, Lisa, Agnes, Alice. What was happening before, it was saying, uh, I mean, I'll stick it up there what the exact message was, I didn't capture it I don't think. It was saying AGA, Alice detected and uh, invalid Lisa or bad Lisa ID. 
uh, and I'll just show you if I jump up one of the jumpers so you can see the jumpers here let me switch this off it's uh, a bit of a mess here and uh, if I just get this jumper on here I might just remove this uh, pin header in a minute because it doesn't serve any purpose really and um, watch what it reports now can you see the Denise ID here uh, Denise Las Felicia F0 F8 that's not correct and if I remove it and uh, reset it again you'll see it changes to I think FE F8 or F8 F8 it's different without that jumper on there there you go FC F8 that's correct so uh, the main thing is we've identified what the cause of that issue was it is those jumpers if you've got a problem with the 166's around there well one of them is going to relate to you the top one is relates to your mouse uh, control so if your mouse is not working it's going to be that top 166 the middle IC the bottom 166 is just used for reading those jumpers and as I said the first two bits pins uh, you know the A pin and the B pin should be pulled low and all the other pins go to the jumper header in my case here I've just hardwired them high so I'll show you where we're at now you can see this looks a mess but you know the blobs of solder there are kind of deliberate to join various pins together I removed the uh, jumper header it was really corroded under it I've cleaned that up really well fitted a CR2032 holder um, it's not quite the right alignment in terms of you know the negative side of the ground you can't get it to go through the hole um, so what I did is just put a piece of wire in so I've soldered it on the underside here we need to clean the flux off there um, the next thing I want to do is remove this resistor. Can you see I put a couple of blobs of solder on it there? So I've just uh, put this on the mat. So you can see the resistor there. I want to remove that and I'm going to replace it with uh, a uh, 0.15 volt uh, forward drop diode. You know, it's a low power, probably like a shot key or something. Uh, anyway, let's just see if we can shove it out of the way. Where's it gone? It's still there. I want to heat both sides. There we go. Hang on. I want to heat both sides at the same time and uh, slide it off if I can. It's hanging on for its dear life, that, isn't it? There you go, it's tombstone. There we go, it's come off on the uh, iron. Just put that into the tray there. And I don't need to remove the sole here. This hasn't been uh, corroded, this little uh, component or anything like that. So I just want to put that diode there so it will feed the uh, battery. So if we just measure on continuity, I want to find out what side goes to the battery contact. So I'm on the positive battery contact. Yeah, it's this side here. So the anode of our diode, the side without the band, wants to go here. And the cathode wants to go there. It's a shame the pad size is not a little bit uh, bigger. Um, because I'm trying to think of the best way to mount this. I don't want it to bridge anywhere, that's the thing. So I just trimmed the uh, legs right off and just mounted it on there, actually it fits perfectly. It's uh, a little bit longer on one side than the other, but we've got a good join, I've just, uh, I'll show you, I've just tested connectivity there. So if we test from the uh, battery uh, contact here, you can see, got a join to the anode and the cathode is definitely going to the other side. So I'm going to stick a battery in there and then go and test the real time clock. So annoyingly it's uh, not detecting the clock, as you can see. So. Uh, I just looked on uh, PCB Explorer, Amiga PCB Explorer, link down below, and uh, followed the traces for the real time clock. I don't see any bad connections, uh, and the uh, one, uh, I forgot what it is now, is it 174 or something down there? And I tested the chip that uh, feeds some of the connections to it, and uh, I see no problems. So the other thing I did here is just get a bit of deoxy into there and twist it slightly either way, you know, trying to move it from its uh, position it's set to. And that made no difference. So the next thing I'm going to do is just uh, scope the uh, clock signal, I think. So I've connected the ground up to uh, the ground and uh, let's just have a let's just have a look. Yeah, you can see the clock signal there. I think that it should be on two pins here actually. Yeah, look, can you see that? It's bouncing around a bit, look. Yeah, it's bouncing around a bit. Can you see that? Maybe that's the issue. Look, that is not stable at all. Let me just uh, try tweaking that pot. It's kind of bouncing up and down, isn't it? That is really weird. So this is quite possibly the worst board ever. 
there were so many issues with this board. I've now discovered a problem with the joystick. So the real time clock's still not working. The ID interface is not working and joystick port one has got a weird issue. Let me show you. Just use the uh, mouse. So if we go into uh, mouse and joystick, so the mouse is working, middle button, right button, that's no problems at all. And on the joystick, button works, up works, watch my hit left. We get up and left, down, right. So left is going up and left and I can demonstrate that by just pressing the button because this arcade stick's got a single button for both left and right. Right goes right, left goes up and left. So I suspected it was going to be something to do with this area. I was hoping it wasn't going to be these shift registers and me having to rewire them and thankfully it isn't. So probing the wires down here, the second one down is up I think. Yeah, can you see what's happening? Press up, goes low and then high impedance, it's not going high. Now contrary to that, if I go a bit further down until we get to uh, one of these others down here, I think it's that one, or is it that one? That one. And if I press left, you'll see it goes between high and low, that's correct. So I worked out pretty quickly there that the pull-up is missing. And I traced it to this block of resistors here using uh, PCB Explorer actually. Such a good website that, it really is. And uh, switch it off, just test continuity. I knew these were uh, a block of pull-ups right at the start here before I did the modification work around here. Uh, what I didn't realise is these are all joined up look on this side here. 4K7 resistors connected to 5 volts on this side. But this top one is not joined. We just need a little bridge here. So uh, I'll just, uh, I don't know, I might even try and blob it with a bit of solder over there. Once those two are joined up, hopefully that should solve that issue. Yeah, so ignore the scary uh, mess there. I'll show you in the daylight. It does look uh, a lot cleaner than it actually looks from a distance. Um, there is a uh, method to my madness here. Anyway, I've just bridged those two. The gap is a little bit too wide to uh, just blob a piece of solder over. You probably, probably could do, but anyway, let's go and try that again. And as you can see now, up goes up, left goes left. We haven't got a problem where up and left are occurring at the same time, just when you press left. It uh, really confused the hell out of me that, if I'm honest. Because it's weird how it wasn't registering as a press when you were pressing other directions. You'd expect it to. So anyway, there we go. So I just used the uh, to solder pump here, just a case of, uh, you know, got the iron quite high actually, about 440 because uh, they absorb quite a bit of heat these and just using the desolder pump here. So having desoldered those, uh, I've just checked the loose and the R, but we'll just do a little bit of this, pivot, one, two, or three. Yeah, that one's just snapped off. And hopefully that should come off without any damage. So this area here looks far worse than it actually is. You know these blobs on this IC here that are deliberate to join uh, a few pins together. So if we just, uh, just carefully see if we can wiggle this a little bit. Yeah, it's pretty loose that. So, resistor array out. We can now uh, just gently clean up the pads here. So, I'll uh, just give it a wipe with uh, some IPA now. Yeah, that's looking nice and clean. I mean, all the stuff around here has been cleaned pretty thoroughly already, but obviously I couldn't get right into the sides of the pins there. And as you can see, the pins on that chip are really good. So over to the uh, second board here. I'm going to start by cleaning up. We we'll use some vinegar initially. Um, there's no signs of life at all with this one. Well, I say no signs of life. You get a black screen and that's it. But it's no surprise, because look how uh, corroded it is around here. So we'll clean with some vinegar, I'll get the fiberglass pen onto it and uh, do some connectivity tests. I'm, you know, I'm guessing it's, it's going to be the issue with these 166s again around here initially. Because if these are not set, you know, if these aren't serialising the uh, options uh, jumpers, then, you know, certainly giving you those two lows for the first two bits, then... Uh, it fails to boot, you know, you just kind of get a black screen or you can get a green screen actually, on the, I noticed on the other one when I was testing that. The other thing is the corrosion around here might be bridging some connections, so you never know, it might spring back to life um, after just cleaning up a little bit here. I'm sure there's going to be lots of faults on this one as well, but if I could just get 
this to boot, it might assist me in trying to understand what's going on with the real-time clock and the IDE on the other one. So I realise I'm skirting over tons of this. Uh, I just cleaned up uh, gently with a fiberglass pen. You can see that first chip there, that side, reflowed really well. This is the second attempt because this chip here has uh, hardly uh, flowed at all. But, uh, you know, and I will replace these. I've got some replacements for these chips. You can see it uh, smokes really bad. You know, there's tons of fumes come off this. You really want really good ventilation if you're uh, doing something like this. With a bit of time, you can see um, it does flow. What I'm trying to do here is get a quick fix, just to try and get the board up and running. And uh, as I say, I'll put some quality time into cleaning up this area properly later with uh, probably some new chips, I think. So, just giving it a quick test at that point, I need to uh, do more. You can see, still not booting. We've got, we've got what I described in the other one, which is like a dark grey screen and a black border. Now this is with the uh, diagram connected actually. Uh, I've checked all the jumpers and things, they're alright. So we've definitely still got something stopping it from booting around that area. But those 166s look flowed quite well actually, and I've uh, probed them with a logic probe and I see signals on all of them, so it's not like anything's high impedance around there. Um, but I guess one of the outputs might not be getting to its destination via a via. It could be a problem with the CPU not booting, but you know I've tried both CPU cards, the slot's okay. So I've got the spare 166s, so let's uh, let's just remove the old ones. Let's uh, pull them off here, let's just hope we don't lose any pads. Up. Yeah, there we, go. there we go. No last pads or anything. It is pretty mucky under there, so uh, yeah, there was an advantage in removing that, I think. We lost a pad there. It's stuck on the end of the braid. I wasn't even going to show you this bit, so uh, hence I did not film it. But I just lightly went over these like this, and that one there just came straight off. I don't think that was causing the problem, though. So we'll just uh, gently clean up now and then we'll get the new chip on. Incidentally the spare 166s came with the uh, uh, 4000 boards here from Stephen. You might have forgotten there was like uh, three of them inside the uh, package in there. Brand new still in the ESD bag so yeah thank you very much to Stephen for those as well as uh, you know providing these boards for repair here. So I've tinned up the uh, traces and wires around there. So I just need to just get that into position. The pad that's missing here is dead easy because there's a little wire there. You can literally just join it up with a piece of kinar. Try not to touch the uh, chip at all. Just get the solder on there. Crazy man. Like that. Do the same thing over here. Crazy amount. There we go. Press it down. Press it down. You can just get some flux on there and uh, reflow that. And then we just got this one little tiny little uh, bridge here. My flux has nearly run out again here. I don't think this is going to make uh, any difference uh, at all to the problem. But we got to rule it out. And it was uh, super corroded there. The one up here may need uh, doing as well. So I'll just get uh, some fresh solder on there and just have a drag like that and just dab into them. There we go, it's looking good as new that side. A little bit more solder and uh, same thing here I think, I can get the iron the right way around. Got to be careful because you don't want to get bridges to the traces you've tinned. Yeah, I think that's okay. Let's just uh, reflow there again. I'll inspect and clean up. 
So I heated the fire there, pushed the kynar into it, and if we flip the board over, find where that's coming out, and it's coming out here, just uh, bend it over. So the new HCT 245's arrived, and I swapped them out on the IDE side, I'll show you in a minute. It looks nice and clean there, didn't lose any pads, it looks perfect. Just the same. So, again, banging my head on a wall thinking, oh my god, this just defies belief. It's got to be, I think, if we assume the uh, gals, you know, pals, gals, whatever they are, are okay. And I think the, it's unlikely that both boards have got both chips faulty. Uh, we saw the same behaviour as we swapped one by one by one each chip around the IDE section there. It's got to be a feeding signal. Now the only thing I could see, I've just I've been staring at that diagram, the circuit diagram, for hours on end thinking, wonder what could be going on here. And the only thing I could think of is this 04 here, it feeds the read-write signal. Now it's an inverter, it's a hex inverter. If I just switch this on, and uh, the read-write signal, if I just uh, probe it here, can you see? It's just stuck high. That's not right the read-write pin should be going between high and low and if I look at its input, hang on, the input's pulsing can you, I don't know if you can see that, I might zoom you in but it's red and it's green, yet the output is stuck high it's not going low I wonder, I've got my fingers crossed, I wonder if that's what's wrong with it uh, it could well be, and it might also explain why the real-time clock's not working, but I'm not sure if that pin is used on there. I can have a look at that in a minute. Anyway, I'm just going to uh, swap, and again, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm going to take the one off the other board, stick it onto this board, and just see if that behaves any differently. Oh yes, I have fixed it, and I am so overjoyed. Now, before I uh, booted it there, um, I disconnected the IDE and I just simply probed the uh, pin here to show you. So if we look at the output, hang on, sorry that's the input, see it pulsing away and look at the output pulsing away. I don't know if you can see that, it is flicking green. So straight away I knew, I thought that's the difference, that's going to work now. Connected the IDE up and I'll show you it flickering. This is uh, what I first saw here, watch, flicker. I was like yes, fixed it. Now it did boot. I couldn't get it to boot, so I thought, hang on a minute, that version of Kickstart I've got on there, it's doing something with the uh, screen mode, putting it in like a higher res, higher colour depth. I wonder if it needs some more RAM, so I added a single 4 meg fast RAM uh, SIM there. And as you will see, it takes a while to boot, but it's booting up, so I am overjoyed. I really am so, so, so happy that I've fixed this. This has been an incredible amount of work. Now the mistake in retrospect, you know, so I'm always learning things myself as I'm doing these videos. I'm not the expert you think I am. I'm not, I'm a novice, I'm a novice, I really am. But what I do is I learn from these things, I learn from my mistakes. The mistake I made on this board was to home in on this because this had um, solder points that had been reflowed around it. And, and Stephen's initial advice there was one of these boards needs a uh, reprogrammed gal. So I thought, that's got to be the one. The other one doesn't look like it's ever been touched. The fact that this one's been reflowed and the ID is not working on this board, let's replace that. So we did that, that didn't solve it. Replaced this, that didn't solve it. Replaced that, that didn't solve it. Swapped these over, that didn't solve it. I thought, hang on a minute, those are from the other board. The, we don't know the state of the other board and we still don't know the state of these from the other board, what well, we do now. Um, so maybe those are faulty so I put the new ones on still the same and at that point I did what I should have done right from the start which is to look at the inputs to these uh, chips here in particular these and that and uh, work out that address decoding is obviously super critical if you've got one signal missing from one on going into one of these from elsewhere in the system this is not going to work this whole circuit is going to do nothing and the only connection I could see around there that I, you know I needed to prove one way or another was that underscore R underscore W. It's the read write pin, but it's like an active low. I think it's flipped. Instead of read, it's the inverse of the read write signal. That's all it is. So it's going to be used in a few places in the system. I'll be interested to retest with the clock now. I suspect the clock's still not going to work, but you never know if that read write pin has anything to do with the real time clock. We might find the real time clock works now as well. So you can see the input there pulsing and the output again it's pulsing so the fact it was stuck on a high that's all it was and I would uh, know that now if I went back looking at uh, another one of these with an IDE fault it's obvious really Occam's razor again you know the simplest explanation being the most likely this is the area that was corroded it was going to be something around here rather than something over there anyway I'm glad I fixed it 
So over to the second board, uh, I'm just going to clean up the pads here and uh, refit a replacement 04. I'm going to try and start working back on this board again now. You can see I've left it for a few days, can you see we've got some corrosion? You know, some of these things are looking a bit white and furry again. This one again is just at the moment showing no signs of life at all. The other thing I might do is swap out this 161 and uh, remove this 174 here and swap that out as well. Luckily I've had a fresh delivery of uh, Flux and Braid because my uh, both had run out actually. Both the Braid and my Flux had run out. But I ordered some from RS online. That's the cheapest place to buy this chip quick Flux from. Uh, I think in the UK. I haven't seen it any cheaper anywhere else. Works out about twelve pounds for six tubes, which is uh, is really good. You don't want to press too hard, but you will get. You see that squeakiness. I've had a few people saying it shouldn't squeak when you push it, but you know what? Um, that's the way I've always done it, and I've, I seldom ever lose a pad doing that. You do need a little bit of pressure, otherwise you don't get any uh, good thermal connection. Let's just trim that back. Yeah, this is literally the last piece of braid I had <laughs> as of about a few minutes ago when some uh, new braid arrived. It's about Australia lines as I can get it. It's quite hard dealing with these because they're so blooming small. You know, you move it a fraction of a millimetre one way and then the other and then the other and, you know, before you know it you've made it really crooked. Um, and I'm just doing the same thing here. There's still a little bit of flux on the pads. I'm just going to heat the uh, pad there and flow a crazy amount of solder there like that. Uh, and then just do the same uh, down here. I'm swing the tip round. It's got like a hook, this tip here. It's like a little point. Makes it quite hard to reflow certain types of uh, points here. You know, you can't, there you go, you can solder as easy as you can with like a, a wedge type tip but anyway that's it it's secured so I can just add some more flux yeah the big problem with this tip can you see it's like a it's like a hook like that a little point it's so thin but the solder accumulates at the top of it anyway you need a fair bit uh, but with these types of uh, you know when I need to reflow this now you'll see the solder oh there it's flowing a bit doesn't always flow very well down the tip you know, there's a lot to be said for the having the right tip for the job on hand. Yeah, that side's not so bad. Uh, this one might be a bit more difficult. Um, I might just try and dab into these if I can. Just because of the angle I'm at. And then I'll, uh, I'll reflow with magnification. So whilst we're here, I will uh, reflow this chip I think, if I can get a little bit of flux on there, and uh, we'll reflow this large one here as well. Yeah, you can hear it fizzing away there, that's just a clue that it's a little bit corroded. That side's looking alright, I think. I'm not bothered if I touch this cap or anything over here because it's going to need uh, swapping out anyway, that cap. All the caps will. So you can see I'm getting uh, bridges there. God, they're awful. I'm not too worried about bridging these at this stage because uh, we can uh, unbridge them in a sec. I really need to bring the iron round the other way, really. Yeah, some of those are just not flowing very well at all, and they look awful. I'm going to remove uh, a lot of the solder here with some desolder braid in a second, I think. So again, I am not worried about bridging these. Yeah, those ones down there have come out okay. We've got a bridge there, though, it's gone. And the options jumper, I'll just remove it again on this board, I think. I might refit one because I think the jumpers should work on this board because we've got both chips in place. 
So I'm not sure if it contains uh, a core, you know, any sort of flux or anything in it, but I think it does actually because I can smell it. Yeah, there we go. We'll just remove some of that crusty solder. If we had a bit more flux, we can just reflow it then. And I'll typically uh, start the mop up with uh, some uh, paper towel like this just because you know there's obviously so much IPA around there it just speeds up the process somewhat and then you can just use cotton buds to uh, get into the little nooks and crannies and finish off. And as I say where well, you've got those dull pins like that on the chip there just a little bit of work with a fiberglass pen and uh, they can look good as new. Yeah, there we go. That was quite hard to remove that, if I'm honest. And instead of like the previous board where they took seconds, those took about five minutes each or something, or three or four minutes each. Um, so anyway, we'll just clean up the pads here. I've got some flux on there. Hopefully we won't lose these pads. Yeah, that side's cleaned up a bit better than the other side, for sure. This, uh, this far right -hand side here is a bit dirty on this one. There we go. Anyway, I'll just repeat that for these other ones. You can see I've left the captain tape there. It just means that if I accidentally uh, bump into it with the iron, it's uh, it's not going to instantly melt. So let's get three new caps on there and uh, just flow a crazy amount of solder on there. Can you see that? Just by virtue of putting flux on it and heating it, you'll find. Uh, you know, you can resize the solder blob there, uh, or just remove the solder from your iron and then just uh, dab into it. You can see that removes some of the solder. Look at that, that's not too bad. So that's one down, uh, two more to go. Yeah, so those just lift out. There's a bit of flux around uh, that pin there, and uh, I'll be honest, it's making a bit of a loose fit anyway. Yeah, that there was uh, wet. I think it's just some flux had somehow got there. It might not be though, it could be uh, electrolyte. This is uh, the thing. And this is behaving like the other one did when we had problems with the clock around here where it just doesn't uh, boot, it's like the CPU's not st starting or something. I'm not sure which of these crystals does what but here. Because um, it was this one that was the one. In fact, that's loose, I can feel it wobbling. So, uh, yeah, we'll just check this obvious stuff really. And we'll just uh, give the uh, pins a very light clean here with the uh, fiberglass pen. I think these ones have been uh, done already, but it's not going to do any uh, harm for sure. And yet again, we're going to clean around uh, this with some uh, vinegar here. And I will leave it to soak for a little bit, actually, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. I'll get a fair bit in there. You want to almost like flood fill these so that the reach the top. I mean it will leak out through the underside naturally. Right that's been a while so I'm going to mop it up now carefully with uh, some uh, paper towel and then we'll get uh, another piece of uh, paper towel here and I'm going to just shove it in there like that and have a bit of a slide up and down but we're going to clean this with IPA in a minute and I'm going to blow it down with hot air, just like I did the other one, and that got that slot super clean, actually, doing this, uh, this you know, series of steps here. And I'll set the hot air to 100 degrees.
There's a bit of corrosion here, you can see that just a little bit, so I'm going to inspect that, clean that up with a fiberglass pen I think, but just make sure that there's no bad wires or anything around that point there. Show you something, I think we have a clock issue. This is the board that boots. Now just watch what happens, this, you've got two crystals, one here, one here. See this pin here? I don't know, you can just about see that. Uh, so it's got a low. Yeah, it looks like a high. Um, but I think that's the clock pin, actually. And if we probe this one here, yeah. The same sort of thing. If I show you the other one. Now it's important to note that a, uh, a logic probe is not the right thing to be doing this with. It should be using a scope. But just look at this here, can you see that? Straight away I thought, that's crazy. That, I'm sure that's the clock output and it's going pulse, 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 you know, high pulses. That's not normal. Not at that speed either. There's like some sort of watchdog or something. So I'm going to have a look at this part of the clock circuit here because we've got some weird pulsing going on over the top of the clock output there. And that is what it is because there's only three pins. One's not connected and then you've got like VCC ground I think and the clock pin. But this is why it isn't booting, that this 50 megahertz clock here is acting very strange indeed. So it's just the same after swapping that crystal, although we're not seeing that high pulsing on the clock pin. But can you see this? I've switched it to its external, the jumpers to the external position. And did you see we get a bit of activity? Not masses, do you see that? It goes low then high low than high. This is the read-write pin by the way. Which makes me think the CPU is running and then it crashes. So I spent a fair bit of time messing around with this. Um, I thought let's look at the output enable. Well the output enable is like the ninth pin up on here and it's high. I've not got the CPU card in here at the moment but what I've just done is I've just written down the signals here. Highs, lows. Uh, we've got one there that's high pulsing on the other board. A bit like this one had earlier on but it's not doing that now. Strangely enough. Um, on this chip here, the 7474. So the clock uh, goes through here, even this 50 megahertz clock, I think is divided down by the 7474. But at the same time, this 7474 is responsible for one of the signals that comes to Gary that ultimately then gives us the output enable, I think, down here. So I was surmising that actually maybe this chip is faulty because we've got, A, we've got, looks like we've got a clock thing going on here. You know, we had some weird behavior with the, related to the 50 megahertz clock signal. Um, I think it's that third pin down, let me show you. On the other one, it pulses high, like this one was doing before. And here, you can see it's kind of really weak. It's hardly even displaying. The other signals down this left hand side of the chip here match my little uh, table there, but it varies towards the bottom. You see on the other one here when there's no CPU card and you get high, high, low, and then high, low, high, low. So if we check here, so we should have high, high, low, so you've got high here, so the supply anyway, high, low, so everything's fine for the first three pins, and then it should be high, low, high, low, and we see, hang on, one, two, three, we see high, nothing low high so it's uh, the pins here are different actually as well as instead of this pulsing high on the other one it just goes like red 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 this one does nothing you can hardly see anything there um, the only thing that connects to that pin that's not flashing is this crystal now I've changed that crystal and I know this crystal's all right because I took this one from the other board that boots and I swapped them around and then I sw also swapped it for another one that I know works and it's doing the same thing so could it be that 7474? I don't know what else it could be around there. I've swapped this because this has and this this has a relationship to the clock uh, circuit. There. I've not swapped that yet, but this chip because it's socketed. I've swapped it. It's you know the other board boots fine with either chip, so it's not that. It can only be this 7474, I think. So I'm just going to quickly borrow the 7474 off the working board and remove the one from this and swap them around. And see if this will give some life to this PCB. Sorry, I'm getting nowhere with this. We swapped the, uh, I'll show you in a sec, we swapped that uh, 74, F74 down there. It made no difference at all. So uh, it's a bit of a red herring, despite the fact I'm getting different readings on this board versus the other board. Granted, I think when I took the measurement, I had the jumpers in the X position instead of the internal position, so that was probably something to do with it. But still, the clock pin itself, it's on one board it pulses high, 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 high. 
with logic probe because the impedance is probably affecting the clock there but nevertheless that's what you see and you don't see that on this board so anyway this there could be something around the clock area what i can do later well uh, shortly is get the scope onto it but the other thing is we haven't spent a massive amount of time around here checking everything I did sort of briefly check the connectivity around here and stuff and check some of the wires not all of them I've reflowed Alice here I reflowed uh, this side of Paula I think did I no I haven't I touched Paula I've done Alice um, so I think the next thing I'm going to do is you know check all the wires around here plug any that need plug in but I'm going to remove that because that one hasn't come off. That one's a replacement. That one's the original. Remove that at the same time. And replace those two chips there. Resolder, reflow these. I tested the connectivity there. They're good. And then just continue to check some of the wires around here as well. Uh, and some of the ones further afield because there's some up here that might be causing us some issues. Um, and just see if that makes any difference, really. Uh, one thing I'm trying to do is take a bit of a step back from trying to follow, you know, chase some symptom. Uh, when it might be, uh, uh, you know, a response to something rather than a cause, you know, uh, it's behaviour related on something else, if you see what I mean. Looking at the clocks, yeah, I can't really see what's going on with the clocks. I could scope them. Um, my handheld scope will only do 10 megahertz, so that's going to be no good. But if I get the hammock onto it, I'll be able to see that. And we'll do that after we've done all this stuff here, see if we can make sense of what's going on. Um, because... It kind of started when I looked at the output enable. The output enable's uh, just stuck high from the ROM. Now, that makes me think there's something going on with the ROM, but then I'm not entirely sure at what point that ROM becomes enabled. Would the CPU need to spring to life in order to drive the address lines, you know, i.e., so if you've got a clock problem or the CPU's not starting up for some reason, then the output enable wouldn't uh, come into play. Um, I think there's also, I vaguely remember, something to do with an OVL pin on one of the CIAs as well. Uh, doesn't that, is it like an overlay thing where it, uh, I don't know, it tricks the address decoder or something, a bit like on the Neo Geo, so that the uh, ROM is in a specific uh, address space. Um, so yeah, so that overlay pin, we might need to look at that, I don't know. It could just be a faulty CIA, that's the thing, we could be barking at the wrong tree here. You know, checking all the stuff to do with clocks and all around here, swapping all the stuff and cleaning up. And actually, the board might work as it currently stands, obviously, with some issues uh, if the uh, CIA wasn't a problem. So it could be CIA. Now, they're about 30 odd pounds, those are spares. They're quite hard to find. Analogic in the UK have got some. Um, but if I was going to do that, I think what I would probably do is remove both CIAs and swap them around. And if the behaviour changed, you know, i.e., we then had a boot then uh, I just get a replacement to uh, CIA at that point, perhaps. But thinking back to uh, Occam's razor again, you know, the simplest explanation being the most likely, it's probably something corrosion related around here that we've missed. This could have died. There we go, let's get that off. Didn't mean to shove it like that, but the flux just uh, assisted. So that's that one. And of course this chip here I don't think is going to be have any kind of relationship to the system not booting. Um, but you never know, it's got some, I think, some data bit or address bit inputs. It could be uh, doing something really stupid on those inputs, some sort of weird failure or the corrosion maybe. Maybe joining something together there, stopping uh, the system from booting. But anyway, there we go, that's those off. Uh, I'll just get rid of that cap as well. Yeah, it's coming off a lot. There we go. Use some of this uh, dissolved braid here and just uh, carefully clean up the pads. A diode's in the way now. The interesting thing is that diode does not feature on the other board. I'm not sure if that was a later mod by Commodore or what. Yeah, there you go. They're not too bad.
Yeah, you see that top pad there. Don't look so clean. But that's also where my uh, scratchy tool comes in. I'll just, you know, and just gently. I have to do it under magnification, but, you know, wherever you've got those little black bits like that, just be very carefully. Scratch them. If we get a little bit of uh, flux here, we'll do exactly the same that I did on the other side that I didn't show you. And there's a few wires up here, can you see I've exposed these as well, um, just around there. Um, now it may well be that these wires aren't going through to the other side properly, but uh, I can measure that in a minute before I solder anything on. Um, the key here is just to tin this stuff up, um, and if we just have a, a bit of a slide, You'll see, you can turn them up, look. I mean, if they're super disintegrated, they might not uh, survive the heat. But most of the time, you'll find that these are okay. The wire here goes to that pad, that's broken. So that first connection just needs, uh, when I put the chip on, just solder a little wire here to that wire and push it through, make sure it's soldered through to the other side. I've checked all the other wires around these on both of these chips here. Um, and the second pin here, it comes up a trace here, which is, you can see little bits of it attend, it's, it's disintegrated. So again, I'll need a wire from here to one of the pins on this resistor pack. But we can deal with that later. And I've removed just for the moment the uh, blobby wire I had between the two pins here and ground. I'll, uh, I'll tidy it up, you know, I'll stick, I'll reflow this chip once we do this one here. And uh, stick a little wire, I'll stretch across those two pins just solder them uh, lightly so there's not a big blob like there was before and then just uh, solder it to the ground again uh, and then we can uh, just finish up by cleaning up uh, these here again I might reflow these and uh, toothbrush the whole area and hopefully this area here should look clean we can deal with that later again it's thanks to Stephen Leary for providing uh, not only the boards but these 166 chips as well this is the third one with three of these in the box so it's been really useful because it means I've not had to order those 166s and there's just enough. We needed one on the other board and two on this board. So there we go, I've uh, re-added that wire there. So a random uh, direction change again. Um, I just started to rethink about the consequences of not having the IDE stuff here and uh, I'm not entirely sure but I see a DSAC uh, signal um, that comes from this as an output actually that goes elsewhere. I'm just wondering if it's confusing matters the fact that this chip is missing. There might be nothing wrong with this board, well there is lots wrong with this board but this board may boot once I've reinstated these two uh, gals here and this IC here. These aren't important, these are just for reading from the uh, IDE. Uh, you know, data bus there. Um, but I thought I'd just show you some of this. Uh, I need to use magnification for most of this, so it's, it's really hard to show you. But it's just, you know, get a crazy amount of uh, solder onto the tip and some flux at the side of it and just flow each pin like this. I'll give you a close up in a minute, but yeah, they come out okay. Just takes a bit of time. And if you get any bridges, just use a bit of the solder braid and then uh, reflow it. So I've got those uh, three chips back on there, they're not cleaned up yet, and you know what, I'm not sure I Adam believe this. It's working! Oh my god, the amount of messing around I have done looking at clocks and everything around there. I could have sworn the CPU wasn't booting, I'm pretty sure it wasn't actually. So it was that, uh, I'll show you on the diagram, that DSAC uh, signal. If you, even though those, uh, those gals there look primarily just for the IDE, they're on the IDE page, it was just looking back at them, just to double check them, and I saw that DS signal, and I had a sinking feeling, thinking, I wonder if that's why it's now not booting. Um, so I think what's happened is, as I've reflowed lots of things, swapped out those 161s, removed the 174, and uh, I've just given the, the board a really good scrub, I've fixed the problem, uh, but it still wasn't booting, obviously just reintroducing that uh, those two gals have solved it. We get a, sometimes a green or a red screen here, so there's something not quite right with it. Can you see it's not going any further than that? But if I switch it off and on, more often than not, in fact, I would say not, not more often than not. Maybe occasionally, it will go through. 
so there's still something somewhere but the main thing is we have some life and when we've got life like this it's much easier to work with so I am so relieved I really am I'm so relieved because uh, when you've got just a black screen like that on a board this complex unless you're an absolute expert and I am not then uh, it can be very difficult to try and understand where to begin you know I'll show you I probed the clocks the jump the two jumpers you can you know change between internal so I scoped those I got the scope set up in the corner there and those were okay and then I started comparing between the working board and this board um, and it was proving painful of scoping all sorts of things and I couldn't see anything unusual I found a weird signal on one of the PLDs up there the girls um, instead of dropping you know having a logic level like that because you could see some little uh, square waves coming out of those PLDs to do with the uh, DRAM uh, timing you know the RAS and CAS signals and things like that go to the sims um, and every the pin looked normal apart from one that where instead of being at the, wasn't at the, went to the ground it was at the top and it was just like bumping up and down at sort of like three or four well four or five volt level um, but I compared to the other one the other one does exactly the same the other one works so that was kind of normal um, but beyond that you know I really did not know know which way to turn with this. Um, on some of the other boards it's a bit easier when you've got a straight 68,000 you can probe the CPU pins but I mean try probing the CPU pins there what's the data bus pin what's the clock what's the reset um, yeah you can look it up and but that's super time consuming I start to test the connections from the uh, this board here the top to the bottom to make sure it wasn't the interconnect but again you've got to come back to the whole uh, you know Occam's razor simplest explanation being the most likely so uh, that's why we ended up back over here after I'd done all the other stuff over there I thought I'm looking at this as if there's something major wrong with it and there probably isn't it's probably something uh, corrosion related or something I've done well the thing I've done is left these off thinking oh, I'll deal with them later we'll, we'll test it without them we don't need those as just for the IDE that was a mistake I missed a, uh, an output and I think that's all it was I think because the DS ACK pin is not going to the Super Gary down there um, I don't know what that's used for but I'm guessing it's something uh, memory timing related you know without that signal uh, weird things are going to happen maybe the CPU can't even boot without that I'm sure that's what it is um, anyway so we can get those two four fives back on afterwards I am not fussed about those just at the moment trust me those <laughs> will not uh, be causing the weird behavior we're seeing at the moment where and incidentally it sort of, the text sort of flickers a bit as well when uh, that diag wrong is booting. The bottom half of the screen seems to double up the text, so there's definitely another fault on here that we haven't resolved. It's not like this is completely fixed minus some corrosion issue around the RAM, uh, you know, the SIMs. Um, there is definitely something still broken, a broken trace or something somewhere, or a faulty IC. So I had to bring the video to an abrupt end again there because there's still a lot of footage. There will be a part four, hopefully part four will be the last part. So special thanks again to Stephen Leary for sending these. I'll catch you in the next video.